Hello, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to continue with graph algorithms. Uh, we're going to uh, cover some minimum, oh, uh, start to cover some minimum spanning tree algorithms. Uh, and then uh, it's, it is Friday, so at the end we'll have a quiz. Uh, remember that that's a, a practice quiz basically that we'll take a, an old quiz that I've got displayed here and we'll go ahead and uh, do it as a review basically. All right, so uh, first of all, uh, we need to define, uh, remember that we got through uh, DFS, BFS, and a whole bunch of uh, applications of those two al basic fundamental algorithms. And the last application that we looked at was a condensation graph. That's where we took this very large graph and we condensed it down into basically a representative graph. All the strongly connected components, those are collapsed down into one node basically. Uh, and a minimum spanning tree, uh, it's kind of the same uh, idea in that you are taking a large graph and then you're cutting it down so that you only have a tree representation of it, okay? Uh, basically given a, an undirected and usually connected weighted graph, that is the edges have weights, right? Uh, we want to create a spanning tree uh, of minimal minim, minimal total weight, right? So what is a spanning tree? A spanning tree is simply a tree that is a subset of edges uh, with the same vertices that spans the vertices, right? All vertices are connected. It's not a, it's basically, you're not disconnecting the graph. You still, from any vertex in the spanning tree, you can get to any other vertex in the tree, in the graph, uh, but overall, and it's not necessarily the shortest path. In fact, you'll be coming up with a counter example showing that a minimum spanning tree does not necessarily give you a shortest path algorithm, uh, but uh, it spans the entire tree and overall, the sum of all the weights in the tree is minimized, all right? Uh, so again, it, it usually we can we think of these as connected graphs. Uh, you can perform a MST algorithm on a disconnected graph. It would just give you a forest instead, a minimum spanning forest, and that is a thing uh, if that uh, if if you want to consider that. Uh, in general, there are many equivalent spanning trees. Right? Uh, but they will all have the same minimum weight, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at two algorithms. We're going to take a look at uh, one algorithm today called Kruskal's algorithms, algorithm, excuse me. And on Monday, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, talk about the other algorithm, Prim's algorithm. There are like a half a dozen minimum spanning tree algorithms, though, out there. Uh, and these are the two standard ones that you you, th you throw out uh, throw out in a class like this. But otherwise, if you're interested, you can go ahead and look up alternatives uh, to actually program them. Uh, some of them are easier to implement. Some of them are a little bit more complicated to implement. Some of them, like Kruskal's here, uh, are going to be efficient, even if you're naive about it for the most part. Uh, but there are, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the details uh, here shortly and maybe even go into the details of the kind of data structures that you would want to use uh, a, di a disjoint set uh, data structure on Monday. Uh, but the Kruskal's is basically a quintessential greedy algorithm. It makes locally optimal choices, right? uh, which lead to a globally optimal solution, right? Uh, and uh, it, that's not the case for all problems. Uh, this is because uh, the, uh, the minimum spanning tree uh, uh, problem of uh, given a graph, give us a minimum spanning tree, has what's called the optimal substructure property, uh, the greedy choice property, uh, the, whatever you want to call it. Uh, basically, it, it states that uh, if you take 
uh, partial minimum spanning tree and another partial minimum spanning tree of a graph, and then you connect them together with a minimum edge that preserves a, a, a globally optimal solution. Uh, the, the global versus uh, uh, local, uh, you can kind of depict it uh, kind of uh, on a graph. All right, so if you've got this polynomial that, that's uh, going up and down and up and down, uh, if you're looking for a globally minimum solution, right, uh, and you 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 get stuck in this trough, right, and you can't get anywhere, right, that's not the necessarily the globally optimal solution. Uh, there might be a trough somewhere else that's even sm uh, lower. Uh, so just looking at a locally optimal solution. Uh, is not necessarily going to give you a globally optimal solution, but for this particular problem, it will. So in other words, we can be greedy about it. We don't have to look at the entire graph. We don't have to do backtracking. We don't have to consider every single possible spanning tree of which there would be a, 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 an exponential number of them. Instead, what we can do is we can just start at one location, or we start small and then build uh, out our, our tree from there, all right? Uh, Kruskal's algorithm works basically by uh, 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 being greedy by taking the minimum uh, weighted edge each time. So the basic idea is that you uh, consider edges in increasing order, non-decreasing order, uh, order of weight, uh, adding them to your tree tree slash forest, because it won't be necessarily a tree at all times. Uh, it could be this disconnected forest of trees that eventually gets connected into one big tree, uh, adding them to your forest as long as they do not induce a cycle. Right? So that's the idea. Now, before we write pseudocode to do this, uh, let's go ahead and uh, do it on an example, basically. All right. So here is uh, my uh, example from uh, the book. I, I, might, I might have gotten this from somewhere. I don't know because I looked at the Wikipedia page uh, just for a, a, a reference uh, this morning, and I saw that it was the exact same one. So uh, I might have stolen it from Wikipedia. Wikipedia might have stolen it from me. I don't know, uh, but here it is. Right? I have no idea. I, I'd, have to I'd have to check my Git repos history on that. Uh, but anyway... Here is our tree, right? Or here is our, excuse me, here is our weighted undirected graph. What we want is a spanning tree. Now, again, the spanning tree is going to be a tree, uh, like it could be this one, uh, like uh, this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, and then this edge. If we took that spanning tree, it spans the, uh, this is indeed a tree. Uh, if you only look at these red edges here, there is no uh, there is no cycle, uh, but uh, and it, so it is a spanning tree because every uh, every vertex is included uh, in that uh, in that spanning tree, uh, but it is not necessarily of minimum weight. If I added these all up, seven nine, so that's sixteen plus fifteen, uh, that's going to be thirty one, uh, thirty six. Uh, and then 8 and 9, 17, so 36 and 17, that's 40, 53, right? We can do better, right? How are we going to do better? We're going to be going about this in a little bit more rigorous manner, right? Uh, there's no reason that we should have taken this, uh, the, this edge over here, all right? We, to get from D to E, uh, well, we could have taken this edge over here, uh, the, this series of edges over here, uh, which is only uh, of weight 14 versus 15, right? Why take the, the, the uh, edges with the most weight? What we're going to do is we're going to go about this a little bit more systematically. We're going to consider edges uh, in non-decreasing order. And we're going to consider the smallest edges first, the smallest weighted edges first. And so I'm just going to note that over here on the right. Uh, a and D... That has a weight, here's the edge, and it has a weight of five. Right. Now, there, granted, there are two of them with a weight of five. That They're both minimum. Uh, so how do you break ties? Well, I'll go ahead and break ties arbitrarily, or I'll break ties lexiographically. A, D would come before C, E, because A comes before C. Okay. When I add it, I update what the tree looks like. Right? 
So uh, first of all, I observe on the first step here, when I do this, I'm not going to induce a cycle, right? It's just, it's just two, at this point, it's just two nodes and an edge connecting them. By definition, there can't be a cycle yet, right? So I've taken this, uh, I added it. I'll note my action here. Right. I next consider C and E. If I were to add that to my tree, though the tree here is highlighted in pink, if I were to add that to my tree, would that induce a cycle? No, because they're, they're, they're not even connected. In fact, if I, by adding them, I have now created a forest. Right? I've created two trees, each with two nodes and one edge in it. So I'll go ahead and add that. It does not induce a cycle. Uh, it does not create a cycle. Right? Uh, the next one that I would consider is A and B with a weight of seven. Again, you're considering weights in non-decreasing order, uh, in uh, basically in, in increasing order. We say non-decreasing because of course you could have ties. Uh, how do you break those ties? Arbitrarily, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add those, uh, A to B. And there is my tree, uh, I've added that to, to that one tree over there. Uh, so I added it. Uh, and you'll note here that it does not induce a cycle. Right? Okay. Uh, B and E would be next with a weight of seven. And I would end up adding them, them too because there's no more cycle. But at this point, I would note that I've actually now taken those two disjoint trees and now I've, I've combined them by adding that edge. So now I'm left with one tree. Right? Uh, I'm not done yet, of course, because I've not spanned all of the vertices. F and G are not part of my spanning tree yet, so I need to continue. Uh, I would continue until I've got all of the edges spanned, or all of the vertices spanned. Uh, and by definition, if you have N vertices, then you need N minus one edges, right? Uh, in a because that's what a tree is, okay? Which one do I consider next? Uh, well, uh, oops, you know what? I think I screwed up, sorry. Undo, 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 undo. There we go. Because I missed another one of weight six over here. There we go. So I've backtracked there. Right. Not purposely, it's not part of the algorithm. Uh, but D and F have a weight of six, which would have been consider, uh, considered first. And so I ended up adding them. Right. There we go. Now, Let's reconsider. Uh, now I would consider those two with uh, with seven, and I would consider them in the same order here. Uh, A, B, seven, and I would add that because that would not induce a cycle right there. All right? Uh, and then I would add B, oops, B and E, and again, that would not, uh, that would not induce a cycle, so I, I've, I've ended up adding those. So here's my tree so far. At that point, again, I would end up reconnecting these two trees right here, okay? So there's my tree so far. Again, I'm not done because I need to uh, still get a G here. Uh, but at that point, I would start considering some other, uh, uh, I would not consider anything connected to G yet because there are two uh, edges here with a weight of eight. Would I end up considering those? So B and C, would be the next one I consider. But if I were to add that, then that would necessarily induce a cycle, which I don't want because I want a spanning tree, right? So rejected, ignored, what do you, whatever you want to call it. I would then consider E and F, also with a weight of eight. But again, if I were to add that, then I would end up inducing a cycle. Right? And so I reject that. Uh, the next ones, if I went in lexiographic order, uh, would be B and D with a weight of nine. But again, if I did that, then I would induce a cycle. And so I ignore it. 
And uh, finally, finally, I get to uh, the one uh, that, that, that completes my uh, spanning tree here, uh, E and G with a weight of nine. And I would end up adding it because that does not induce a cycle. Okay. And there's my spanning tree. Uh, I added it. Do I have to consider the remaining edges here, 15 and 11? Right? Uh, well, obviously they would induce a cycle. And so I would not want to ultimately add them, but do I even need to consider them? No, remember there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vertices here. If I have a spanning tree, then I necessarily need to have six edges. One, two, three, four, five, six at which point I'm done and I no longer have to consider any additional edges because I've built my tree. I can stop prematurely, basically. You might have the worst case scenario where it's the last place you looked, right? That last edge is the one that you need to complete your, uh, your spanning tree. Uh, but otherwise, what is the total weight of this spanning tree? Again, I did not take these three. Uh, so if I added these up, then I would get uh, 15, 16 plus 14, that's 39. That's much better than when I just randomly chose uh, a bunch of edges uh, and, uh, and got 53 or whatever it was. Right? Uh, this is a minimum spanning tree. There may or may not be an, an equivalent spanning tree with the same minimum weight. Uh, given a graph, of course, there can be many spanning trees. In fact, if I gave you an unweighted graph, uh, that is a, a, a graph with um, uh, uh, uniform weights of one, right? That's how you should look at it. Uh, then any spanning tree is going to be a minimum spanning tree. How many of them are there? There are going to be an exponential number of them. Uh, you have m edges. You just you, you can't just arbitrarily choose n minus one of them. Uh, you have to be judicious about that. Uh, but you, uh, you so that's a, that's an upper bound though. That's a, that's going to be exponential already. Uh, there you could take this edge or not that edge, right? You could you could, if you started out with a uh, if you started out with a complete graph, uh, you know order n squared edges. Uh, and you had to choose n minus one of them, then of course, yes, there's going to be an exponential number of possibilities there. Uh, any, uh, but uh, again, it, it, we just want to find one, right? Uh, and Kruskal's gives us one by going in order of weight and then breaking ties arbitrarily or uh, by lexiographic order or something, okay? So let's codify that. Um, let's, uh, here come back to that later. Uh, let's codify that with some uh, pseudocode. Okay, still no question. Again, if you have questions, go ahead and post online. Uh, if you see me make a mistake, like missing that six before, go ahead and post. Uh, so here's my input. It's a weighted, directed, or sorry, undirected graph, G equals V comma E. Uh, you can talk about spanning trees of directed graphs, but it does it's not all that useful. It's not and it doesn't make as much sense uh, as undirected because uh, just because you can go from A to B doesn't necessarily mean you can go back to uh, B to A. In other words, you can have something that looks like a cycle, right? Uh, a to B to C to D, and that you wouldn't want that, but uh, you but you could take, uh, the orientation may, be, may mean that that's actually not a cycle, right? Something like this. Uh, what is the, sp the spanning forest of this thing, right? Or spanning tree of this thing? Uh, do I have to take all the edges? Uh, well, if I do, it looks kind of like a cycle, but it's not because there's no directed cycle in this. Uh, so it doesn't it, it doesn't make a lot of sense with directed graphs, uh, but you can, you know, have some some notion of a uh, um, uh, a notion of a, a, a spanning force for that. There is a question online. What was the song playing right now? Uh, that was Johnny Cash, uh, Man in Black, I think. Right. So output is going to be a minimum spanning tree MST of G. Right. 
Uh, and I don't, I'm, I'm saying again, a minimum spanning tree. There could be many equivalent ones out there. Okay. All right. So the first step of course, is to sort edges and I'll give them a name. E1, E2, dot, 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 EM in non-decreasing order. Of weight. All right. That's step one. Then what we did is we continue once we once we had them sorted here, uh, we went over one by one by one. And we che uh, checked, did it add, uh, did that induce a cycle? Uh, if it did, then we ultimately ignored it. If it did not, then we added it, all right? So all I need to do is go over a while loop here. I will have an index variable here that I'll initialize to one. That'll keep track of which edge I go through on each time. So K is gonna be one, two, three, four, all the way up to M. But I'm not gonna use that as a control structure. Instead, what I'm going to do is, is a while loop. Because remember, we didn't run through all of the edges. We stopped short. Right? Once we had enough edges, then we were done. Right? So while the edge set of T, right? oh, you know what? I didn't give myself some, enough room here. Uh, let's go ahead and move these things down. There we go. And I will correct this, the edge set of the tree is going to end up being initially the empty set. And I'll comment this. Uh, this is the edge set of the minimum spanning tree. Right? Initially, we don't have any edges. We're not taking the edges yet. And so uh, we will update that by taking the edges. Right? While the card, oops, sorry. While the cardinality of that is less than n minus one, right? remember, once we've taken n minus one edges, that spans the tree, right? And so we, we, we can jump out of this while loop here, right? If, say, I've got the vertex set, the vertex set here is the same vertex set as the original graph, because I wanna span all of the vertices, but the edge set, the edge set that I've built so far, if I were to add the kth edge, and form a new graph here. Right? Let me annotate this. Uh, this is the new graph, and it's not necessarily a tree, it's not necessarily a forest, uh, but this is a new graph that would be created by adding E sub K, if that contains a cycle or if it is acyclic, right? If it contains a cycle, then that means that we don't want to add that edge, just like we didn't do over here. Uh, adding BC would end up inducing a cycle. So we don't want to add it. But if adding it means that it stays acyclic, then we permanently add it to our edge set here. Right? So E sub T will be updated to be E sub T and then union that edge. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to increment K here. Uh, basically, that's just keeping track of the edges. Next edge, next edge, next edge, dot, 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 dot. All right. At the end of this while loop, we simply just output V and E sub T. Five, six, seven, eight, okay, and that's it. Uh, let's go ahead and analyze this a little bit. All right. So, analysis. All right. First of all, what's our input? It's a graph. What's our input size? N, the number of vertices in the graph, or M if you wanna focus on uh, edges, right? So uh, the one, the input is G. Two, the input size. N, M, which one? 
the number of vertices or the number of edges. Well, let's look at what we're doing in here. One thing that we're doing is we're sorting, but we're not sorting vertices, we're sorting edges. So that sounds kind of expensive. Uh, this is just done once. This while loop here is iterating over potentially all of the edges, right? Uh, because uh, we, we, like I said, you could get unlucky and the very last edge that you add is the one that you need, right? So you could go, in the worst case, you could end up going through all of the edges, right? Uh, checking whether or not something is acyclic is that's actually not dependent on the number of, of original vertices and edges. It's dependent on the size of this graph right here, uh, which is the, sa the same number of vertices, uh, but not necessarily the same number of edges. Okay. Uh, adding an edge, that's nothing to a graph. That's just setting a, 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 a value in the adjacency matrix or adding something to an adjacency list or something. Uh, that's not uh, all that big of a deal either. That's uh, just plus plus uh, necessary for the control structure of iterating over each one of these edges. So what are we doing? Uh, let's take a holistic point of view here. Um, sometimes we'll consider M, sometimes we'll consider N. Uh, what is our elementary operation? Something to do with edges, something to do with vertices, right? Uh, let's, let's take it in phases here. What about line one? If I were given a collection of edges uh, of size M, that's gonna take me order M log M using merge sort or quick, uh, you know, quick sort or, or a Tim sort or something like that uh, to sort all those edges. Okay, uh, that's completely independent of the number of vertices, by the way, because we're only sorting the edges. Um, line four, that has the potential to be order M, right? Again, in the worst case, you could iterate through every single edge, okay? Uh, what about line five? That, uh, those are the three that I'm going to focus on. Again, this is, uh, that, that's just setting a, a flag value. This is just incrementing. It's not necessarily related to the number of vertices or the number of edges. Uh, what about, uh, I, I'm forming this new graph here. That new graph has n vertices. Uh, how many edges does it have? Does it have all of the original uh, m edges? No. Uh, it has, at most, when we get down to it, n minus 1 edges. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right? In the very beginning, it doesn't have any edges. Once we've added one edge, then it has a new edge. Once we add it, then it's a little bit bigger. Uh, we add another one, and well, now it has three edges. So basically, this is changing right here. The size of this is changing. Uh, but the same number of vertices. So let's look at it from the worst case scenario here. Uh, at the very end, when I have almost uh, n minus ed 2 uh, edges in there, uh, n and n minus 2. Remember that B uh, BFS or DFS, if you use those for cycle detection... DFS, BFS, FS, excuse me, is going to be, the way that I pointed it out was order N plus M. But remember, and, and certainly we have N vertices here, but how many edges do we have? We don't have M where M is the original size of the input. Instead, it's at most N, right? Uh, because on the first iteration, there's only one. On the second iteration, there's only two. In the worst case, at the last iteration, when we're performing DFS, BFS over and over again using uh, to, to do cycle detection, uh, that's that has at most n minus two edges, and therefore m is going to be order n, and this collapses down into order n. Right? So line five, if you use BFS and DFS here, is going to end up being order n. Okay, so let's bring all of that together down here. Line one is independent from line four and five. So that's going to be order m log m plus, and then what's the complexity of these two things combined? Well, you're executing BFS and DFS which is going to be order n in the worst case, 
but you're executing it potentially m times. So that's going to end up being order m n, right? Uh, now, which one of these is bigger? Right? Uh, you can go ahead and simplify this down. Let me go ahead and get rid of all this over here. Order m log n, uh, sorry, m plus m n. Now, here's where it gets tricky because at the end of the day, I'd really like just one variable here to tell me what it is. Uh, if uh, if uh, if I, I assume that m uh, that it's a dense graph right that m is going to be order n squared and i replace that n squared down here what do i get well n squared out front here order log n squared that's nothing the two comes out front log identities and it becomes log n uh, but this one becomes ooh, that's really bad so if m is order n squared then this entire thing becomes order n cubed, right? Because then this becomes the dominant term. Uh, if it's a sparse graph, or maybe even uh, in the the other way, uh, the other uh, direction, uh, what's the minimum it could be? Uh, it could be order n, because we said that it did have to be a connected graph, otherwise you're talking about forests, minimum spanning forests. So if, or excuse me, if m is order n, then this becomes, right, uh, n log n plus n times n, it'll end up becoming order n squared, okay? That's if you're naive, doing it naively, right? So if you, actually, let's go back to the notes here. Right. Sorry. So I, I can type this instead of just writing it out, right? All right, so... Uh, if you naively use BFS DFS to detect cycles, you'll get basically order n cubed in the worst case, right? If instead you use an alternative data structure, something that you probably haven't seen before. It's called a disjoint set. There we go. Then you can get it down to order m log m. Right. And basically, uh, we might go over it on Monday, but we're not gonna get to it today. A disjoint set uh, is a data structure that holds stuff. Uh, and supports some very specific, it's kind of like a restricted access data structure. It's not a general purpose data structure. Uh, what it does is it holds a, a collection of disjoint sets. Uh, initially, all of the edge, uh, all of the vertices are in their own disjoint sets because you have not built a tree. Uh, as you start connecting them with edges, uh, then you start collapsing these sets down. So basically what you need is you need a way to create, initialize uh, this, these disjoint sets. The disjointness means uh, that if you've got this set and you've got this set, their union is empty, uh, that there's nothing in common. And that basically maps to the idea of crew schools where uh, you, you built this, this tree over here, you built this tree over here, you built this tree over here, you had a disjoint forest. Eventually you collapse these by connecting them with an, uh, with a, with an edge. So with the disjoint set data structure, what happens is you want to take these two disjoint sets and then you want to combine them to, together to take their union, right? Or sorry, I think I said union before. Uh, their, their intersection is the empty set. Uh, what you want to do is you want to combine them so that you're collapsing these down. Uh, so you need a way to initialize it so that you have all these end disjoint sets. You need a way to uh, find uh, what, uh, you know, whether or not there are two, uh, here's, here's the endpoints of the edge, A and B. Are they already connected? Because if they're already connected, that means that you would induce a cycle, right? Uh, let me go ahead and picture that over here really quick. Uh, here's the idea. So here's, I'll call it X and Y, right? And we've already built this tree, uh, this tree up here, right? Uh, and should we add this edge here between them, right? 
Well, if X is connected to the rest of the tree somehow, and Y is connected to the rest of the tree somehow, and there's some path already connecting them, right? In other words, they're already in their, their, their same connected component, then that would necessarily induce a cycle. Right? And so we don't add it. So basically, given the endpoints of the uh, of the edge, we want to know, are they in the same disjoint set? So that's another operation that it needs to support. And then finally, the third operation that it needs to support is, given two disjoint sets, we want to combine them together efficiently so that we can we can continue uh, with the with Kruskal's algorithm, basically. Uh, and that's called a disjoint set uh, data structure. Again, we're not going to go into the details today. Uh, we might do that on Monday. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is, uh, give me one second here. I'll be right back in two minutes, uh, one minute. All right, so back, sorry about that. Uh, I just have to, I had to take care of something family oriented, right? All right, so there we go. Uh, back to uh, our analysis here. So if you use this disjoint set idea, uh, then, you can, uh, then you can get about basically down to order M log N uh, by not having to perform a DFS or a BFS uh, over and over and over again. Instead, you would just ask, uh, are they already in the same component? If so, then I don't want to induce a cycle in that same component, okay? Um, the other thing that we might go over on Monday is a proof of the correctness of this algorithm. It's basically an inductive proof. Uh, it's basically you are proving that it is a, uh, that it has an optimal substructure property. Uh, that the, this greedy choice property of always going with the next smallest edge that necessarily leads to a minimum spanning tree. Uh, and so it's a proof by induction slash contra, uh, contradiction that you assume that it uh, that you assume that it does not lead to a minimum spanning tree. Uh, that there's some other tree out there, that, that spanning tree, uh, that has a lesser weight. Uh, and then you will eventually lead to a contradiction or something like that, right? Okay. All right, so that's Kruskal's algorithm. And again, we might go over some of those details on Monday. Uh, what I wanted to do, of course, it is Friday. Uh, and so uh, during you know a, a traditional offering of this course, uh, we might have a, a quiz and a recitation or something like that. Uh, and it, this is a quiz from uh, summer 2019. Uh, and as you can expect, it's on graphs, a recent material. Here's an undirected weighted graph. Uh, and then we're going to, of course, perform some DFS, BFS, and maybe build a tree out of this. Uh, but the first couple of questions here, uh, mark either as true or false. You need not give any justification. Uh, DFS and BFS are exponential algorithms. Mm, certainly not. Uh, if you did a naive DFS where you didn't keep track of where you've been and where you're going, uh, like we did with uh, ha the brute force Hamiltonian path problem, then sure, certainly it's going to be exponential. Uh, but BFS and DFS are only uh, going to be linear algorithms uh, because they examine each edge or vertex at most once. Or if processing is your elementary operation, then it's going to be order n because you only process each node at most once. So that's going to be false. DFS can be used to find the shortest path between any two vertices in the graph. That's also going to be false. And uh, again, we don't need to provide a justification here, but we will. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, transition over here. 
right? And let's go ahead and come up with a counterexample, right? Uh, and it said the shortest path between any two vertices. So let's go ahead and go with A, B, C, and then D. Right? And I'll just let, let this be a cycle graph. This is a C4. Right? If we were to start our DFS at A, right? Uh, I'll switch over to red here. Uh, then we would want to go as deep into the uh, into the graph as possible before backtracking. Uh, so we'll go from A to B, B we go deeper, B to C, C to D, right? And that gives us a DFS tree that looks something like this, A, B, C, D. If we just looked at that BFS tree, uh, then, or that DFS tree, excuse me, uh, then we would get the impression that to get to D, I have to take one, two, three edges. Whereas the shortest path here is simply just A to D, right? Uh, even if you're inside the algorithm uh, the, uh, and you see that there is indeed a back edge here, right? that's not necessarily going to tell you what the shortest path is, right? Uh, you could come up with more complex examples uh, and counter examples to show that. DFS is simply just used for, it can be used for a lot of things, but it's used for traversing the graph, not necessarily producing the shortest path. Uh, we're going to get to some shortest path algorithms next week, uh, Dijkstra's, Floyd Varshall, et cetera, but DFS by itself, vanilla DFS will not give you that kind of a, a application. BFS can be used to determine if an undirected graph is a tree or not. That's true because BFS can be used for cycle detection. And cycle detection, if it has a cycle, then it's not a tree. If it doesn't have a cycle, then it could be a tree, right? Uh, you, distinguishing between a tree and a forest is trivial as well if you have to restart a BFS. So this last one is true, or this uh, third one is true, right? Perform DFS traversal on the graph in figure one using lexiographic ordering to determine the next vertex. Indicate the discovery time uh, order, uh, uh, of the traversal, uh, order of the traversal. Draw the DFS tree that results with any forward, back, cross edges. Start at vertex A, okay? Uh, so I've already got that over here. Right, here it is. Uh, let's go ahead and start performing a DFS. We will start at A. Right? So the discovery time stamp here is, gonna, uh, let me go ahead and go with red since it's already black. Red, we start at A. I uh, remember that it said the lexiographically next. So I'm looking at the neighborhood here and I see B, F, and D, but lexiographically B is the next one. So we would end up traversing to B. Uh, remember that we're also coloring our vertices as we go along. Uh, A is now gray. B is now gray because we were visiting it, right? Um, red, I'm just using that to, to keep track of our tree vert vertices here. Uh, at B, I look at its neighborhood, but I see that A is already visited. Uh, C and F, the lexiographically next one, would of course be C. And we color it. And I forgot my discovery timestamps here. Oops. Two, dot, dot, three, dot, dot. There we go. I'm looking at the neighborhood of C here. And uh, B is already gray, so that's not a candidate. Otherwise, I have E and F. So I, the next lexiographic one would be E, 4. And it's also colored gray. At which point, I'm looking at its neighborhood, which is C. But it's already gray, so we don't end up visiting it. And we end up finishing E at timestamp 5. And backtracking, coloring this, black. All right. We're now at C here. We've backtracked. I look at the neighborhood and I see a gray vertex, which is, means that it's uh, visited but unprocessed. I see a black vertex, which means that it has been visited and processed. And then finally, I see an unvisited white vertex over here. So let's go ahead and go to it next. And color it gray giving it a timestamp, discovery timestamp, excuse me, of six. All right. I look at its neighborhood and I see all of the other vertices virtually, except for E, uh, but gray, 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 
but this one is white, so I end up going to it and discovering it at timestamp 7. Colored it gray. At that point, I've basically discovered everything, and all there is left to do is backtrack. Uh, so finishing timestamps are going to be 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And of course, I was coloring these black all the way back. There we go. Uh, it wanted us to then draw uh, the resulting DFS tree. Uh, that was A to B to C. Uh, there we go. C to E. But then we backtracked to C and went over to F. And at that point, we were able to go forward to D. Okay. Now, what about those other edges there? What about, uh, let me change color here, blue, all right? What about this edge, this edge, and this edge? How do we, those get connected? So A to D, there we go. Uh, A to F, and finally B to F. So B to F here, all right? These are all, forward slash back. There's, remember, there's no orientation here. So forward edges and back edges are the same edges. Uh, it was kind of a trick question to ask for cross edges in an undirected graph in the BFS tree because there are none, right? Okay. Uh, that's BFS or DFS, excuse me. Let's go ahead and start over with BFS. Okay, uh, the, the BFS uh, that is in the quiz is giving a different criteria here, the least weighted edge according to, and to, uh, to, to choose your next vertex. Uh, and this one, of course, is still start at A, okay? Uh, so I'll use the same, uh, here I'm only going to do dis discovery times maybe, I don't know. Um, one, I start at A. I'm NQing it, remember, I'm using a Q now instead of a stack. I will color it gray because it goes into the uh, uh, into the uh, Q, right? Uh, and then I look at all of its neighbors, right? I see B, F, and D. Right? Now, if I went in lexiographic order, then certainly I would go with B because B is next. But in the quiz, it asked to go into the, uh, go to the, uh, go in the order of, uh, the edge weights, in this case, one, three, four. So I would end up going to F, two, then B, three, then F, D, four. Uh, but I would end up enqueuing all of them into the Q. What is your Q, what does the Q look like right now? A has already been popped out or pulled out or whatever, whatever it DQ'd. Uh, and then we've got B, F, and D in there. All right. At that point, we're, we're done with A, and so we end up processing it. Uh, and then on the next iteration, we end up DQing B. And so we're here. We look at its neighborhood. Uh, this is connected to a black processed vertex, so we don't consider it. Uh, C and F, we consider those, except that this is gray. It's already in our queue. It's been visited, but not processed, so we ignore that one as well. And we just go with C here. NQ it, color it gray, mark its timestamp, two, three, four, five. All right. All right, and that's good. We're done. On the next iteration, we DQF. There we go. Uh, and so we're now at this location here. I look at its neighborhood and I see a gray vertex, gray vertex, black vertex, gray vertex. And so I end up doing nothing, right? I'm not adding anything further. On the next iteration, D comes out. 
And now we're at this location here, but I see black vertex, black vertex. So, uh, oh, I, I never colored B there, sorry. There we go. Uh, and so we don't end up doing anything. We color that black. And finally, C comes out of our Q. We see E, and so we end Q it, color it gray, and we've discovered it at timestamp uh, six. Uh, and then we're done with E, or sorry, C. And on the next iteration, E comes out of the queue and we end up completing it. So the ordering timestamps are here. The BFS tree would look like we went from A and then we went left to right here. Uh, we went to F, then B, then, uh, now I can't read them, unfortunately. Uh, C, uh, C was next, uh, B, F, D, there we go, B, oh no, so, uh, F, B, D because of the, uh, uh, Lex uh, the least weighted, uh, edge next property that we were told to use, All right? There we go. Um, then we went. Uh, one, two, three, four. Then we went with C off of F though, uh, right? Yep. C. And then we processed B and D, but not finding any neighbors there. Then we went to C and that's where we discovered E hanging off of it, right? Those are all the tree edges. I wish I'd drawn those in uh, in red as well, on, the, on the, like I did with uh, uh, BFS, DFS. Uh, we can do that, we can correct for it. Uh, there, looking at that neighborhood. Uh, from F, we went to C, and then from C, we went to E. There we go. So now what about these other uh, edges? This one, this one, and this one right here. Uh, D and F, that looks like that. That's a cross edge. Um, F and B, that's also a cross edge. Connecting uh, Both of these are connecting siblings. Uh, and then finally, uh, B and, uh, I already did B and F, right? Yeah, uh, and then this one is B and C. There we go. And there we go. Uh, that's also a cross edge. Remember, Another trick question here. There are no forward edges. There are no back edges. Uh, forward edges, back edges are the same because there's no orientation. Uh, but also there's no forward edges because if there were, A going down to a descendant C, right, that would have been discovered when I looked at A first. Right? So all of those are going to be cross edges. All right. No questions so far. So it was not on the quiz. Uh, but let's go ahead and do a minimum spanning tree here with crew schools just to get a little bit more practice. And that's the last thing we'll do for the day. We'll cut it early. All right. So crew school. We'll consider edges in the order of their weights and take note of the actions that we've taken. Uh, so there are two with weight one, that's AF and DF. I'll go ahead and consider them in, al uh, in lexicographic order, AF and DF, each with a weight of one. And clearly I'm gonna take that first one no matter what. So taken or added. And let me go ahead and highlight it. I'll use this color here instead, AF. There we go. Uh, now do I add DF? Yep because that would not induce a cycle. So same, taken. Uh, the next edges that I would consider are BC and CE, each with a weight of two. So BC and CE, there we go. So do I take BC? Yep, because that would not induce a cycle. There we go. So taken. 
would I end up taking CE? And the answer again there is yes, uh, because it would not induce a cycle. In fact, these are still two uh, disconnected components at this point. Uh, even though they're, uh, the, the way that it's drawn, these edges are intersecting, they're still two diff different components. A, F, and D, and B, C, and E are disconnected still. So taken. There we go. Uh, the next one we would consider is, is also the last one uh, because it's going to connect A and B with a weight of three taken. And we're done. Now they are in one connected component. And you can see that it's actually just a line, right? But a line is still a tree. And so that's where we stop our algorithm. Right? No questions? Uh, so hopefully you're continuing to work on your uh, program. Uh, that's the bulk of the points again for uh, the, your suite of algorithms. Feel free to use Kruskal's algorithm. Feel free to use DFS, BFS for cycle detection. All, uh, you're not going to run into a huge issue uh, with a, a n cubed algorithm doing that. Um, so uh, you know you don't have to. I don't even know if there is a disjoint set implementation in Python. Uh, they'd probably just tell you to use a, you know, just a regular old dictionary or something like that, or just uh, a, a bunch of sets uh, and then collapse them as necessary. That's not going to be as efficient as a disjoint set, uh, but it, it will be hash based. So it's still probably going to be pretty efficient in practice. Um, and again, you're not going to have any huge graphs uh, running on the web grader. Right? You're not going to have graphs with, you know, a million uh, vertices. And so your algorithm is one million cubed, that's not gonna happen. All right, so have a good weekend, no questions. Uh, I'll see you on Monday.